source of all life and goodness. You bring us the gifts of joy and peace, but greater still are the gifts of your love and your presence. Open the eyes of our hearts today. We want to see you in this hour, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, now and forevermore. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Opening hymns on page 163, Ashley White, Great Things I Know.
Gracious Lord, with a worshipful heart, we come before you giving thanks, offering back to you what you have already given to us, that you may bless it, grow it, further it for use in your kingdom and us in your service. In Christ's holy name, amen. Great grandchildren. But I celebrate that. Congratulations. 
Congratulations. What else do we celebrate? The, uh, our little grandson, Nathan, will be born uh, October 18th.
that when people look at us, they see your spirit, they see your light and your love, and Lord, that they want to know more about you. For Lord, we give thanks as we pray, uniting our hearts, remembering the prayer that our Lord taught us when he said, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our hymn is on page 376. Um, the hymn that I chose this morning as a congregational specialist, one of my favorite hymns, but it was just as I am in congregational art, um, is the, it tells the events of one man's journey of faith. Um, and I think that I've mentioned this history before, it's been a while, maybe to some merits uh, replay. But this is the story of Horatio Spafford, and like Job, he put his trust in God, not only in the good times and the prosperous times, but also in the bad and tragic times of his life. Horatio was a wealthy lawyer. He was a successful businessman who sold real estate. Uh, he was a family man. He had a loving wife and five beautiful children. He was a devout Christian. He was an elder in his church. And he was good friends with the great evangelist, Dwight L. Moody. But in 1870, a series of events would turn his world upside down. His only son died of scarlet fever at the tender age of four years. One year later, on October the 8th, 1871, while still grieving the loss of his son, he lost everything in this devastating historic Chicago fire where in two days, 300 died, 100,000 were left homeless, and there was $200 million worth of property damage, including his real estate investments and his law firm. He had already planned a holiday uh, to, with his family to <coughs> to help the old movie one of his crusades, but a last minute business deal developed and it was forced to Horatio to stay in Chicago, but not wanting to ruin his, ruin his family's holiday convinced his wife, Anna, to take the children and go on ahead to feed the father later. So Anna and their four daughters boarded a French steamer and set sail for England. Tragically, midway through their voyage, the steamer was struck by an iron sailing vessel out of Scotland, and the French steamer sank in 12 minutes. As Anna stood bravely on the deck of her daughters, she knelt and she prayed to God to either save them or give them courage to die. Her last memory was her children being torn from her arms by the force of the water. But miraculously, Anna was saved by a wooden plank that was her unconscious body was floating on that kept her up out of the water. The Spafford's daughters, ages 11, 9, 5, and 2, were among the 226 that perished that day. It was the worst tragedy in naval history until the Titanic sank 40 years later. Soon after Horatio heard about the shipwreck, he got a telegram from his wife with six words written on it. Survived alone, what should I do? I mean, it was in it. What should I do? Horatio boarded the next ship out of New York to go to his grieving wife, and during his voyage, the captain called him to come to the bridge to tell him, he said, I believe that we're passing the very place where the French singer sank. It was there that he coined the words that led him to write this song, It is well with my soul, for I do not believe they are here, they are open in the arms of Jesus. He wrote the lyrics to the song in 1873. Philip Bliss, who wrote most of the music for Fanny Crosby's hymns, wrote the tune that we know today. In the last verse of this song, we're going to sing, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. Because when we get to heaven, we will see that our faith will be a reality. And we will see God face to face. As P.D. said, his hymn is on page 377. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the fourth verses. We're going to sing it like a special because we're going to start off the first verse. 
Spirit very softly, and we'll feel the third verse will be a little bit louder. And on that fourth verse, we're going to sing a little bit slower, period, um, Sarah. And I want them to hear it instead of raining when we sing this song. Uh, the chorus, the ladies will have a lead it as well. The guys will be the echo. Just follow my lead, okay? As we sing it as well. Because they're, as the Bible says, quote unquote, 
doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so the prophecies are about or against Israel and trying to get them to straighten up. And of course, the people of Israel are real happy anytime they tell them to straighten up. So that's kind of the first part of, of Jeremiah. Then the middle time is during the, the, the occupation as King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon comes in and pretty much destroys Jerusalem and starts to carry everybody away. And there are slaves now in Babylon. And most of Jerusalem is destroyed. We can read about this in the story of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's what that's all about. And then the last part of Jeremiah is really about the, the promise. The promise of God's fulfillment and restoration. Chapter 32 kind of comes in a mid-area, kind of bet between the time of the first part of, of the, 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 the hard sayings against Israel, but just before the occupation of Babylon. Because as Jeremiah has been saying all these bad things about the king of Israel, the king of Israel, of course, doesn't like that, and he has Jeremiah put in jail. So now Jeremiah is in jail. And the... The clouds of Babylon are just about to overrun Jerusalem. And, you know, if, I, I would think that if we were thinking stock market, and you knew the stock market was about to fall, what do you want to do? Come on, what do you want to do? Sell, sell, sell. Get rid of it. Jeremiah's cousin says, hey, I got some land for sale. Let's hear about this. Uh, first of all, 32 verses 1 through 3. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, that's the king of Babylon. And the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. And, Jer and Jeremiah the prophet was confined in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace of Judah. Now Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had imprisoned him there, saying, Why do you prophesy as you do? You say, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to hand the city over to the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Zedekiah, the king of Judah, will not escape out of the hands of the Babylonians, but will certainly be handed over to the king of Babylon, and he will speak with him face to face and see him with his own eyes. He will take Zedekiah to Babylon, where he will remain until I deal with him, declares the Lord. And if you fight against the Babylonians, you will not succeed. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, the son of Shal uh, Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field at Anathoth, because as the nearest relative, it's your right and duty to buy it. Then, just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the, God, of the guard and said, Buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it's your right to redeem it and possess it, and buy it for yourself. I knew that this was what the word of the Lord, so I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel, and he weighed out for him seven shekels of silver and signed and sealed the deed had, and had it witnessed. He weighed out the silver on the scales, and I took the deed of purchase, and I sealed a copy containing the terms and the conditions as well as an unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Baruch, the son of Uriah, the son of uh, somebody else, not Messiah, is not important. <laughs> in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the witnesses who had signed the deed, and all of the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the garden. In their presence, I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord God Almighty says of Israel says. Take these documents, both sealed and unsealed copies, the deed of your purchase and put them in a clay jar so that they will last a long time. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses and fields and vineyards will be bought again. Land. Beloved, it's the word of God for the people of God. Let the people say, thanks be to God. Lord, thank you for reminding us that your love and your spirit continues. Help us to invest in all the blessings that you Christ's holy name. Amen. So I wanted to talk about investing. And you know, when we think about investing, a lot, a lot of times we think about investing with money. If we have some money, we want to put it in something that we know is a sure thing, that we're going to get our interest, our return out of. But when we're talking from the pulpit, we're talking about investing in the spirit. 
And investing in the Spirit means what do we do with all of who we are as we give it to God? And whenever you join the Methodist Church, we ask you to do four things. Anybody who has joined the church while I've been here these past eight years, whether they've gone through con confirmation, so all you confirmation kids do that, or not, I've asked you to do four things. Make a commitment to God through Marvin United Methodist Church to, to serve Marvin with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. This is on page 38 in your hymnal. And all of the Methodist pastors that have come before me that might have used the Methodist hymnal as we talk about making a commitment and joining the church, to just do these four things. And as I do that, I am always flabbergasted how people come out of the woodworks. People that come together and say, oh, I'm a member over at Marvin's. I've been there eight years and I don't think I've seen you once. <laughs> or people want to come and have weddings and they claim that be members of Marvin, or people want to, to come and have their kids involved in the program, they want discounts because they're members of Marvin, and yet they have not been a part of the life of the church at all, at least in my understanding. And I think we are called to join, first of all, God, to make our commitment to God, but as we do that, we usually have some kind of institution. It's a fallible institution. It's a human institution. But it's an institution nonetheless here at Marvin to serve with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. Prayers, I'm hoping we got. I, I don't know anything about your private prayers, but I'm hoping all of these people that I encounter are praying for Marvin. But then your presence. Presence we can keep up with. There's little books at the end of the pew we can keep up with. And we know most of you. And if you don't show up for a while, kind of like, oh, where's so and so? So we know your presence. Your gifts. Your gifts are usually in the form maybe of tithes, as we're all encouraged to tithe 10%. But we know Methodists are really lousy at tithing 10%. They're good at tithing and giving money away to a lot of different things. It's just that they, they typically tithe only about 2% to the church. But when it comes to stepping up for supporting the whatever scouting program or whatever the kids are doing or whatever needs to be done, they usually are very, very generous in supporting all kinds of programs for the sake of God. But gifts can be more than just money. Not everybody's got money. Is there an amen? <coughs> wrong congregation. All right. <laughs> Not everybody's got money. But you know what? Every person is unique. Every person has a gift. Some of you are good with a hammer. Some of you are good with a sewing machine. Some of you are good with cooking. Some of you are good with planning. Some of you are, have those, that detailed eyes that can see all the little things. Some of you are good with organization. And, and so we all have our gifts that we bring. And we give to the altar as we invest in our church. And then there's service. And there's lots of different things. In this season of Charge Conference, as we're starting to set up leadership, and we're asking you, what ways do you want to be in service to God here at Marvin United Methodist Church? And, and, and I've already had some people come to me and say, like, I've got some ideas of ministries. I've got, I've got a, a, a little stirring in my heart about the church could be doing this. And I'm like, great. Let's see if we can organize that and put some, put some feet on it, make it walk, make it talk. And so we're all encouraged to invest and use our faith as we join the church, as we join up as part of God's ministry. But I think that even after we come out of COVID and for a lot of us with denominational struggles, now having a tough time investing their whole heart into things because things aren't right. Now we have Jeremiah talking to us from some 25, 3,000 years ago. Now Jeremiah is in jail. Okay? Jeremiah is in jail. The clouds of the Babylonians are all around them. The city's cut off. There's no, there's no connection to food or water. And the city is dwindling. And it won't be long before the Babylonians are going to break through those walls and the entire city's going to be destroyed. Good times. And in the midst of this, like I said, if you heard the market was going to take a nosedive, you want to sell. Jeremiah's cousin comes to him because they have this kind of thing in the, in the, in the old ways. It's sort of like the right of first refusal in order to keep the, 
the land and the family and a cousin gets the first chance to buy it. A cousin comes and says, by the way, you know these Babylonians about to take everything. So, hey cousin, you want to buy my property? Sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? And if it does, I got some swamp land in Florida. In the practical eyes of human beings, the ways of humans have always been foolish. But God's ways are full of wisdom, full of justice, and full of truth. Because this isn't really a story about financial gain. It's a story about faith. And Jeremiah lives into his prophetic by being in action. And he buys the cousin's property. And as he buys the cousin's property, he goes through all the details where he gets the right lawyers to sit down, and they sign the documents, two documents. One is for practical use, as they have to pull it out and use it, but the other one is sealed in clay jars and put away. It's kind of like their, their version of putting it up in the vault for the future, because Jeremiah has a vision for the future. And as he has a vision for the future, he wants everybody to see that God has a vision for the future of Israel. God has a vision for the future of his church. God has a vision for the future of Martin. And we've got to invest in that, folks. We can't pull back. We've got to put our hearts into this and to keep going forward. Jesus didn't quit on us. Jesus invested his entire soul and being in our failures in our sin and in our brokenness. And he took that. He didn't have to. Remember that night? Lord, let this pass from me, yet not my will, thine be done. And he carried that all the way to the cross. That's the ultimate investment. That's the ultimate investment in us. And as part of the church, whether we be members or not, we are asked to make a commitment, to make an investment in all things spiritual, in all things good, in all the things that bring us closer to one another and closer to God as we grow the church and as we grow the faith. Because ultimately, that's really what it's about now, isn't it? Do we have faith in the future? Do you think something's going to come? Something good can come over this denominational nonsense. Do you think something good can come over the political strife that we're, we're having going on. Do you think something good can come of Marvin United Methodist Church? Because if you don't, then you're going to pull back. And you're not going to make that investment. God's not done, folks. Hasn't been done for a long time. He keeps investing in us time and time and time again. We are asked to have faith. Faith, you say? Hebrews Chapter 11, now faith is being sure of what we hope for. Whew. That's it, isn't it? What do we hope for? Think about it. What do we hope for here at Mark? What do we hope for in our denomination? What do we hope for in this world? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Because I tell you what, folks, I don't always see it. Y'all see it? I don't always see it.
Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. All God's children say. Amen.